With today's sermon in our series, Life Hacks, Pocket Tips from Proverbs for Better Living, here is Senior Pastor Mark Rader. Our proverb for today uh, is uh, from chapter 13, verse 24. Again, I'll read it a couple times if in case you wanted to actually try to get there. Chapter 13, verse 24. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Uh, We have a dedication in our second service. It's probably appropriate that we deal with this passage, isn't it? Uh, And uh, as I mentioned last week, the book of Proverbs is amongst the most intensely practical uh, literature that you find in Scripture. Uh, It deals with uh, the nitty-gritty aspects of day-to-day life. It's also amongst the most, I guess what you might call the most secular, in the sense that it doesn't deal with the day-to-day practices of religion. You don't hear a lot about offerings or about prayers or about sacrifices. Sacrifices. Uh, you don't hear a lot about the great promises of God to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. You don't hear much about the exodus from Egypt or the law that God gave to Moses. You don't hear much about the temple or Jerusalem or David or any of those sorts of things. Instead, you find a literature that is grounded in the basic understanding that this is God's world. This is our Father's world, as the great hymn stated it. Uh, and therefore, by observing how our Father created not just the material world, but the moral world, we begin to see certain patterns. Uh, And those patterns can be applied in the very basic um, relationships of our lives uh, with our children, with our spouses, uh, with those that we work with and those we work for. Uh, It has uh, things to say about how we use our speech, uh, about the sorts of friends that we keep, and and on and on it goes. And and so this passage, this passage dealing with children, is a fairly straightforward and expected kind of proverb. Because what gets more nitty-gritty and down and dirty than raising children? Right? Uh, It's an enormously difficult task that requires a great deal of wisdom, does it not? Uh, The wisdom of chapter 13, verse 24, is that if we are going to raise our children and we want to raise them in a way that is loving, then we will provide them with discipline. Now, a little bit of uh, definition might be useful. Uh, The word in the NIV that's translated as discipline is a word that's used almost exclusively in the wisdom literature, the book of Proverbs Uh, the book book of Job, a little bit in Ecclesiastes, and it is most often translated as instruction. If you do have your Bibles with you, have a bit of a look at uh, chapter 1, the very introduction to the book of Proverbs, where we find this same word uh, translated as instruction in three different places. So this is how the book of Proverbs begins. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom And instruction, that's that same word that's translated discipline, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction or discipline in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, the way that this word is translated in chapter 13 as discipline makes a little bit more sense because it is coupled with the word rod, right? Uh, It's the same word that's found in Psalm 23. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me in that great psalm. Uh, And so given that the option of translation could mean instruction or discipline, but there's a stick involved, sounds like we probably want to go discipline rather than instruction, but they're kind of one and the same. This is not the word though that means, shall I say, punishment. That's a little bit different, isn't it? This is about the discipline and instruction, the boundaries and structure that help our children grow up into wise people. Now, once again, the book of Proverbs has more to say on disciplining children and instructing children than just in chapter 13. 
If you have a look in chapter 22, verse 15, we have a similar but slightly different take. The, the, uh, the proverb is that folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Uh, I mentioned last week that there are stock characters that you come across in the book of Proverbs. Uh, on the one hand, you have the wise. That's who we are all as, uh, kind of a trying to become, uh, become. On the far end, you've got fools. And even farther out, you've got mockers. But there in the middle, you have the simple. Uh, and the simple are generally the young uh, for whom folly is bound up in their hearts. Uh, in general, in, in the book of Proverbs, the simple, if left to their own devices, will become fools. That's kind of the long and short of it. Uh, if uh, someone is simple and nobody provides them with instruction, nobody provides them with discipline, no one provides them with insight and correction and all of those sorts of things, then they will inevitably become fools. But there is hope that the simple might actually learn and listen and grow and develop and become wise. So we have a very interesting kind of view of the human heart, don't we? Folly is bound up in the human heart, but discipline and instruction will drive it away. If you have a look in chapter 23, verses 13 and 14, it says, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. And again, we have this reminder that ultimately what the book of Proverbs is on about, uh, the ultimate aim and goal of raising children or of, or of being wise ourselves is to become wise. In the book of Proverbs, there are two ways to live. You can live wisely, which leads to, to life and success and all of that stuff, or you can live like a fool, which leads ultimately to your own destruction. And so this idea of raising children and giving them appropriate levels of instruction and discipline uh, is, is, is observable wisdom, isn't it? You don't really need to be a Christian to figure that one out, do you? And you have a look at the world and children who have no discipline, who are given no instruction, tend to be certain types of children, don't they? Uh, you might talk about them as spoiled. You might talk about them as out of control. You might talk about them in all sorts of different ways. But we know the value of giving instruction and guidance and discipline to children. However, can I just point out one of the, one of the implications of Proverbs being so short? You know, there's just two lines. So there's not a lot that they can say. And what they do say has certain really important limits upon it. And that is that there is no guarantee that this wisdom that you find contained here will actually work. You know, last week I mentioned that you can have mutually exclusive proverbs, right? Uh, so uh, he who hesitates is lost and look before you leap. Uh, and those are both true. The question is, when are they true? But there are times when it, it'll look like you need to hesitate, when you need to, you need to look before you leap, and it won't work out. The Proverbs are not ironclad guarantees. Uh, they are observable truths, kind of rules of thumb. And so in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, which some of you might be familiar with, it says, start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. That's good wisdom, isn't it? That, that is good wisdom, generally speaking. If you raise children in the way that they ought to go, if you instruct them in wise living, uh, if you provide discipline and structure for them in the ways in which they should live, chances are it's going to turn out all right. But we all either have children or know people who have children or who have grandchildren and we have seen children and grandchildren raised in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they have departed from it, haven't they? These are not guarantees. These are not promises. But they are the observed wisdom of the world. They are the observed wisdom of our father's world. Chances are, you raise children properly, they'll turn out properly. But we have to keep these things in mind. Now, can I just say, this talks about the rod, uh, and views on discipline have changed quite a bit in the last generation, haven't they? I was actually thinking a bit about it this morning, and I, I do recall when I was in grade school that uh, one of my classmates got caned. 
Um, and, and I suppose it's a lot longer ago than I feel that it is, but uh, it wasn't that long ago, it seems to me. Uh, and uh, we are a lot more aware, are we not, about the, uh, the spectrum, shall we say, of discipline and punishment and abuse. Right? And, and, and while there's a big difference between uh, giving a young child a slap on the wrist uh, and, and beating someone, we know that they're on the spectrum, right? And, and we have to be very careful, of course, that any punishment that we might uh, d- um, bring to our children is not done out of anger or not done out of some desire to control them. We need to be very aware of, uh, of our society. We need to be very aware of what's good and, and, and excellent for our children. But none of that keeps us from the principle here, does it? that ultimately we need to provide our children with instruction and boundaries and discipline and from time to time some form of punishment in order that they might, well, in order that they might what? What what are we actually aiming at with our children and our grandchildren? It's pretty tricky, isn't it? Because I think, you know, our lives are so driven by the immediate and there's nothing more immediate than children, isn't there? I mean, when they're, when they're really little, it is just, it's immediate. Everything has to happen right away. And in, in my experience, I've got three teenage daughters now, uh, it doesn't change. It's just that it's no longer that they need a snack immediately. They need to get dropped someplace immediately. And uh, they need to get down to the train station immediately. They need 30 bucks immediately or whatever it might be. And so it's just become a lot more expensive, really, uh, over time. Uh, But when we're caught up in the immediate, when we're caught up in the things that are most urgent, we can end up forgetting where we're going. We can end up forgetting what we're actually aiming at. And and I think it's easy sometimes to assume that what we're trying to do is create children who are, you know, just well-behaved and don't embarrass me in public, which which is not a bad thing, is it? Uh, uh, We can think that we kind of want our children to be, you know, nice rather than naughty. But can I just remind you that in the book of Proverbs, that's not the outcome. The outcome is not about having nice children or uh, as opposed to naughty children or well-behaved and respectful children as opposed to whatever the opposite is. It's actually about children who are wise. And in our first week, we ended up looking at the theme of correction and that one of the indicators of someone who is wise is someone who loves and listens to instruction and correction and advice. And so ultimately what we're trying to do with our children and with our grandchildren where we are able is to instill in them a love of discipline and a love of instruction and a love of even that kind of, you know, the, the necessary punishment to learn how to live wisely in this world. Ultimately, that's what we want to produce. You know, when uh, our girls were younger, we often talked, you know, because they're young women growing up in the society in which they're growing up, uh, one of our hopes for them was that they would grow up comfortable in who they were, uh, that they wouldn't be too caught up with body image, that they would have a self-esteem that went beyond how they looked. I'm not sure exactly how we're going. We seem to be doing okay some days, other days I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, we, we, we want our children, we want our daughters to be resilient, to be able to handle being told that they weren't the best, uh, to handle disappointment, to know how to handle failure, to know how to celebrate a good friend's success at their expense. We wanted them to have that resilience to kind of get through life. And you probably have similar hopes and dreams for your children or for your grandchildren. Uh, we would often have, we would, uh, many of us, of course, would have um, spiritual hopes and aspirations for our children. Uh, that they would uh, come to know and follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior, uh, that they would have uh, good friends, and, and, and on and on it goes. The book of Proverbs desires that people become wise. And so ultimately the question for us in terms of uh, the discipline and instruction we provide our children has to do with how do we raise children, how do we raise grandchildren to love instruction and correction? because they are actually wise or on the path to wisdom. 
And, and that, that kind of reframed it for me in a fairly significant way. I kind of wished I'd preached on this, say, 18 years ago before we had children. Um, because there's a few things I think that we talk about when we talk about instructing and disciplining children and all that that entails that I think are fairly helpful for us. You know, so things like consistency. Right? You've probably heard or read or told somebody that being consistent in how we raise our children is, I don't know if it's nine-tenths of it, but it seems to be a pretty big part of it, right? We need to be clear about our expectations and consistent in that. So uh, what good behavior is today needs to be what good behavior is tomorrow and what good behavior is the day after that. We have to be consistent in our follow-through. If we say that if they do X one more time, then there are going to be consequences uh, Y, and then we need to make sure that we follow through. Consistency is fairly significant. I think in, in our day and age, particularly as our children uh, reach adolescence, there's a greater and more important emphasis on listening to them. I was uh, recently reading a, a book on, um, on youth and families and the church, and one of the things that these uh, researchers pointed out is that adolescence now is a lot longer than it used to be. Uh, and there are two things that have happened. On the one hand, people, young people are arriving at adolescence much, much earlier. Uh, both physically but also socially. So you don't have to look much further than the smartphone revolution, right? And the access that children have, even if we are very, very careful, to fairly significant and complex issues in the world, right? And so there's a sense that our children are growing up far more quickly, that they're entering that kind of, I think what I would have said was late adolescence much earlier. But the marks of completing adolescence... You know, moving out of the house, uh, getting married, having children, theoretically in that order, right? Sorry, in a different order, right? It is is uh, no longer the case, right? And those things are happening later and later and later. Uh, I don't need to tell you that uh, children are staying at home longer and longer and longer, which, which, is, which is great. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, and they're putting off marriage later and later and later, and children beyond that as well. And so we actually have this longer period of time where our children are still technically in this kind of extended adolescence. But they're no longer little children. We, we can't treat them like little children. We have to treat them as adults, and we need to invite them into the decision-making process, and we need to listen to them, perhaps perhaps more than any generation of parents and grandparents has had to listen to their children because they are still, in so many ways, not yet adults, even though they're the right age for an adult. Uh, and some of them have even made the, the, some of those steps of, of adulthood that we would traditionally see as the, as the transition points uh, into adulthood. Uh, and, and so listening becomes a really important skill for us uh, to begin to nurture and to develop. But I was, as I was thinking a little bit more about what it means for us to raise children, uh, to be influences in our grandchildren's lives in order that they might become wise, you know, one of the most powerful things we can do, of course, is, is the life that we model for our children, isn't it? It's, it's frightening. It's frightening how much our kids pick up from us. Uh, you know, I'm saving up for the counseling because I'm sure it's going to be costly at some point in time. You know, like... Uh, you, you, you see it. You see you in your children. Uh, and, you know, there are moments of joy when you see your spouse in your children, which is lovely. Or when you see something that's neither you nor your partner in your children, you think, wow, uh, something has happened there, the work of God. Um, so how do we model then? And what do we model for our children? And this brings us back to what we talked about in our first week, which is about a love of correction. Are we modeling what it looks like to live a wise life? And are we people who appreciate and love correction and instruction? Comes back to that listening thing a bit, doesn't it? Comes back to those conversations that we have with our kids when we have to acknowledge that we probably weren't right. Uh, when we did the wrong thing, we said the wrong thing, we did or said the wrong thing at the wrong time, we said the right thing at the wrong time, whatever it was, where we are actually willing to, to listen, where we're willing to acknowledge that we were wrong, where we're willing to listen to them, hear from them, and then respond appropriately. I mean, how much wisdom is required for that? Quite a bit, isn't it? 
But it seems to me that if we can be modeling that kind of a wise life, that it will also make a huge difference in our children's lives. You know, and, and all of this, as I've already stated, is, is largely the wisdom of the world, shall we say. Uh, you don't need to be a follower of Jesus to look at God's world and see God's patterns. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to recognize that children need instruction and correction and discipline and all of those sorts of things. That, that's, not, that's not a radically profound religious or theological statement. But it's important then for us who follow after Jesus to also recognize that uh, it's not just about consistency and clarity and listening in relationship to, you know, how they respond to situations at school. But it's also how we model and pattern for them what it means to follow Jesus in the first place. Deuteronomy chapter 6 opens with these words. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flung with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. We are called to model more than just um, disciplined life. We are called to model more uh, than just kind of standard wisdom. We are also called to reflect the deepest foundation of wisdom, and that is the fear of the Lord. The deep respect for his commands, for his ways, that's reflected in everything that we do. And I believe that if we can be effective models of what it means to love and follow Jesus, if we are learning the attitudes and the characters of humility uh, and love and kindness, then when it comes to raising our children, when it comes to the influence we have in the lives of our grandchildren, that there will be ample opportunity for us to set them on the path that they should go. Ultimately, a path of wisdom and life. This is another pocket tip from Proverbs for better living. There's heaps more where that came from. We hope you've enjoyed today's New Horizons program. You can download the companion study guides for each program from the Guymere Baptist Church website. Go to guymerebaptist.org.au forward slash New Horizons. These are available for each episode or you can download the whole series. Guymere Baptist Church in Sydney's southern suburbs is a contemporary evangelical church seeking to serve our local community and help them to know Jesus. At the heart of all we do is the desire to help people love God in all aspects of their lives. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can do so by the contact page on our website or visit our Facebook page. The book of Proverbs includes some of the most intensely practical wisdom that you'll find in Scripture. It talks about things as nitty-gritty as friendships and the words that we say and even about raising our kids. And if there's an area where we need wisdom, it's certainly in raising children. The proverb we looked at today talks about the importance and significance of providing instruction and discipline for our children. And ultimately our desire, our goal for them is to raise people who are wise who themselves love instruction, who love discipline in order that they might succeed in life. For us, part of that is wrapped around things like consistency and clarity and listening, but it's also about modeling for them, not only what it looks like to um, love instruction, but also what it looks like to love and follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I trust that you have been encouraged in the midst of all this, whether you have children, whether you're an uncle or an aunt or a grandparent, trust that the influence that you have in the children in your life might be a positive one, leading them down the path of wisdom. Hope to see you again real soon. God bless.